so this is going to be a Zoom uh, webinar, and we're going live on Facebook as well. So if you are tuning in by Zoom, uh, just know this is a Zoom webinar rather than a Zoom meeting. So if you have questions during the class, then we are going to have you type those questions into the Q&A box. If you are on Facebook, which we should now be on live, I'll be monitoring the comments during the class uh, so that we can get any questions to David for you. Um, David is going to be discussing spring lawn care today, I believe with a focus on weed, dealing with weeds, weed, weed prevention and weed control. Is that correct, David? That's it. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and let you dive in. Thanks for joining us again today. All right, thanks everybody. And uh, thank you, Sally, for being here again today. Uh, again, you know, I enjoy doing these uh, virtual plant clinics every couple of weeks. And since I last saw you, of course, we had a blizzard with 55 mile an hour winds, temperatures in the teens. We also got almost up to 80 degrees. So it's just that kind of March situation, right? But uh, tomorrow, I think they're saying like high of 74, that blue skies with just a little bit of clouds in there. So, so spring is definitely on the way. Uh, that's why we're showing you the color here, try to get you all ready for that. And first and foremost, I should be saying, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Uh, so that is, this is all happening all at once. So that's why we're wearing the green. I got the shamrocks. Uh, try to kind of coordinate a little bit with the events of the day. So what I want to do is, as always, I've got some slides, a little video, a few products to show you. We're going to talk about kind of a little bit about spring lawn and garden care, but that really means to me, first and foremost, we're going to focus our attention on weeds. Weeds are the number one source of complaints uh, from lawn scare maintenance uh, or just landscape maintenance perspective. It's because they're really visible. Uh, they can be difficult to manage and it's confusing. And so we're going to take the time that I have to really kind of delve into that topic. I like to say also that weeds are, there are winter weeds, there are summer weeds, there are perennial weeds. So there are weeds constantly throughout the year. So this is sort of a 12 month thing. And then you get into the whole issue of your personal preference, deciding what's a weed, what's not a weed, how many you can live with, which ones you can tolerate. Uh, so there's just a whole lot of variables to go into this, a lot of different steps and measures we can go. And I'm going to spend my time really just trying to educate everybody about weeds and their biology and some of the basic concepts on how we go about managing those. And of course, we will be taking questions throughout the program. So certainly get prepared to share those with Sally. And we're going to kick this thing off with a little video on weeds, if I can make this play. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm just out here enjoying a little quiet time, a little meditation on a beautiful spring day surrounded by these beautiful carpet of wildflowers. So I thought we'd take just a minute here to play wildflower or weed. Uh, so just this little spot where I'm standing here, this beautifully diverse collection of plants, first thing I spot is just the common chickweed. This was actually brought to this country by European settlers as a culinary herb. Uh, it was actually used as a salad green, but that's when it's before it's flowering when it's a more tender state. This is an example of a winter annual. So now in early spring, it's flowering. It will go to seed and then that plant dies for the summer. So this grows during the cool temperatures. And then in front of me, I have this carpet of this beautiful purple flower. I have customers bring this to me to clinic all the time for identification because they want to add it as a ground cover in their garden. Um, it's called ground ivy or sometimes creeping Charlie. It's a member of the mint family and it's a perennial. So with each year it creeps and spreads and spreads and spreads. So it does get this beautiful purple flower on here um, in the spring, but then it lives year round. 
course, the problem is in a garden setting, it gets pretty aggressive and tends to outcompete the other plants around it. It was again introduced by the Europeans and brought here for both culinary and medicinal purposes. Uh, right in this same collection, of course, dandelions, which everybody knows, uh, is brought here as a culinary herb, is also a perennial. And these plants now, they've escaped into the environment and sometimes people consider them weeds because they do spread about and they do become quite aggressive that's in there. And I look around and off to my side I see dead nettle. Uh, dead nettle also a member of the mint family but it's a winter annual and again it was brought here as a medicinal and culinary plant but for many of you because it reseeds itself and starts growing in places we don't exactly want it to grow, we'll consider it a weed. So again, that is today's edition of Wildflower or Weed, You Decide. So I love talking about weeds. You guys know this one of my favorite topics uh, for good reason. Essentially, you integrate horticulture and biology, a little bit of history, uh, and get to learn all about what's going on around you. So just that little video, I was talking about wildflower weeds. One of the things you may have noticed, I like looking at their sort of origins and how they came to be. And most of these are introduced plants, not native or indigenous to our region. And so as you learn more about them, you start also learning a little bit of our, our own history. So these are examples of weeds that you will typically find popping up in your garden. You might even see them now. This would be the very early season for them blooming. Uh, but over the next one, two, three weeks, you'll see more and more of this happening. Uh, so this, as we showed in that video, this is one's called bittercress. Again, it is in the mustard family and it was introduced to this country on purpose as a culinary green. However, if you were to eat it, it is very bitter and deserving of the name bittercress. Uh, chickweed has a similar kind of history. It's a different plant family, so we call the pinks family, similar to actually the same family as carnations are grown in. And if you look really closely at the flower, use your imagination some, you kind of start to see that resemblance. Uh, but again, this is one that was brought here by Europeans along with dead nettle and several of these, and they have just continued to remain, but they reseed themselves prolifically and grow everywhere. So all of these are good examples of what's referred to as an annual weed. That means that it goes from seed all the way through the seedling stage where it is right now. It will begin flowering very soon, if not already. After producing seeds, this dies. So it goes from seed all the way through maturity reproduction starts new seed all within one year. That's why it's referred to as an annual weed. And these are examples of winter annual weeds. So this is where things start to get interesting. I was going to say confusing, but I'm gonna try to start using the word interesting because if you went out last fall when temperatures were getting cooler in September and October, you would see these little seedlings starting to germinate. I think I took this picture in about October time period. So this is what I call that seedling stage. They'll continue to live through the winter time. They love the cooler temperatures. And now as we go into spring, it's time for them to reproduce. As the days are getting longer winter and warmer, you'll see these flowers starting to produce. So the chickweed, the bitter crest, the dead nettle, and many people will start coming to the plant clinic saying, where did these come from? They just suddenly appeared. And it's a good example. No, they didn't just suddenly appear. It's just they were in their seedling stage. They've been there for some quite some time. Now they're flowering. And after flowering, they will die. So that's an example of a winter annual. There's a whole nother set of weeds. Like I'm, I'm just giving you a second to see if you can identify these. It's 
I, I will mention, I've got a test at the end of this whole presentation. So, so pay attention. Uh, but these are a couple of weeds that you don't see in your garden now, but they're examples of summer annual weeds. So the spotted spurge, the purslane, they are lying dormant right now. Uh, they don't grow during the cool season. So the seed lies there in the soil. It waits through the winter. As our soil temperatures begin to warm up and we start going more towards May, June, July time period and the heat of summer, these guys suddenly explode. So it's an example of an annual weed, but this is a summer annual weed. These are other examples of common summer annual weeds. Most of us are familiar with these, but the top one there, crabgrass that you can see, the seed again is sitting there, it's in the soil, it's lying dormant. And as our soil temperatures start getting into the upper 50, 60 degree kind of temperature range, these seeds will begin germinating. I'd like to really emphasize one of the reason that we call them weeds is that they are so, so effective biologically in terms of their survival strategies. So what will happen is if a crabgrass plant, a mature big crabgrass plant goes to seed, let's say we had this last year, that plant will produce up to a thousand seeds. Now those seeds that are lying in the surface of your soil, they're not all going to suddenly decide, oh, it's, it's May 1, let's sprout today. No, they stagger their germination time over a period of weeks, months, and years. So on any given year, only about half of that seed's gonna germinate. The other half is gonna sit there to stay in the soil. This is what builds up, we, we refer to as a seed bank. So these seeds accumulate, they sit in the soil and they will persist for many years, okay? Another very good example of this is Japanese stilt grass. It follows a very similar kind of life cycle that crabgrass follows. Uh, it's just, it's a different grass. And this one can also grow in the shade. So where crabgrass tends to grow in really hot, sunny areas, the stilt grass tends to grow more frequently in shady, moist environments. So again, they were introduced accidentally. So these, actually, I'll, let me back up. I'm gonna say crabgrass was no accident. Crabgrass was introduced and looked at as possibly a forage grass for raising livestock, which it's not very good at. Uh, so we brought that one in with us. And then the Japanese stiltgrass came accidentally as a packaging material. It was essentially cut for straw. Fragile, delicate things were packed in it to help protect it during the shipping process. And then those seeds escape and it continues to persist. So each one of these kind of has their really own story as to how they got here and what they're doing. So those are both examples, like I said, first of a winter annual weed and then a summer annual weed, but they live, die, and reproduce all in one season. There are also perennial weeds. So clover, the white clover that you see over here, uh, that is a perennial, which means that it flowers in late spring each year, produces seeds. Those seeds do go on to multiply itself, but the mother plant just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. So sometimes these perennial weeds become more difficult to manage because they have a root system that gets more entrenched and more deeply established each year, as opposed to annual weeds that die and start over with each season. It also is really great because it brings up again the whole topic of what is a weed, because white clover is a fantastic ground cover in a lot of ways. Uh, because it stays low, the flowers are, are very appreciated by pollinators, especially bees that are in there. It's intentionally mixed into a lot of forage crops and pastures because it's what's called a legume. It is capable of forming symbiotic relationships in the soil with bacteria, and it can take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and convert it into organic matter. So it actually produces its own fertilizer in a sense. And so some people will actually intentionally incorporate this into lawns as a natural form of fertilizing. So it comes into this whole thing where it's, it's really a matter of perspective. 
Of course, I had to feature it today because it is St. Patrick's Day and it was famous. Apparently, uh, St. Patrick used the clover to sort of try to explain the Trinity. He's credited with bringing Christianity to Ireland and he would use clover and show the three leaflets as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And of course, we continue to develop all kinds of uh, lore and stories around our plants. And the four leaf clover, which I guess statistically ranks about, you'll be lucky to find one in 10,000. So that is a rare find, but we go out, we look for the, for the uh, four leaf clover. And then the lore is that that is going to provide faith, hope, love, and luck. So again, Today is St. Patrick's Day. Maybe you can honor and go out and look at the, uh, for those. And then, of course, what's called oxalis. Uh, many, many times it's mistaken for clover, but it's a different family. You can see its difference in the flowers and uh, the leaf, but it's it, a little bit similar, so people get them mixed up. Uh, the wood sorrel is often a, a persistent perennial weed, especially in flower beds. And then, of course, there's the oxalis, the, uh, that's the shamrock that we fit into with our, uh, with our St. Patrick's Day and makes really a lovely little house plant or a, a garden perennial. So, again, all this really comes down. I'm not trying to sell you or one way or the other. Everybody has to make up their own mind on what's a weed and what is not. So, again, these are perennials. So they go through that same life cycle of seed to seedling mature they produce their seeds, but they don't necessarily die at the end of that period. They'll go into a dormant or a, rot or a resting condition. So that's my little rundown on biology of the weeds, how they grow, where they plant. I'm going to continue with this a little bit in terms of talking about our control options, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, so hang with me. I usually try to take a break about now, but we got a lot to cover. So you can already see as we're talking about the biology of them. I look at weeds as being opportunists. Uh, where we maintain a dense, thick stand of turf, where we keep that ground covered, we can basically preclude or prevent weeds by occupying that soil. Wherever we leave exposed soil, weeds will grow. Because again, they're, they're they produce a lot of seeds that seed bank persists forever they've got great ingenious ways to disseminate the seeds and everything so our first and foremost our way of managing these is to prevent them with good cultural practices and that means keeping the soil covered whether that means covered with turf covered with mulch covered with ground cover covered with plants uh, we want to try to occupy that ground so that the weeds don't have an opportunity to go in there I also say minimizing the soil disturbance because every time we cultivate the soil, we also bring up a fresh crop of weeds. So sometimes with a new garden, we may have to go in there and do more tilling and cultivating to get the soil developed. But once we get a garden established, anything you can do to minimize tillage also helps to minimize weeds. And then the weeds that do slip through there we can usually manage just by hand digging. But I am going to also talk quite a bit now about some of our chemical options because where we lose the battle, where the weeds move in, it gets ahead of us or it's just too big, a lot of times we do move into using these chemical options. And this whole thing begins by understanding is it annual weed, is it a perennial weed, is it a summer annual? Is it a winter annual? So I always, always like to begin by getting a good identification on that. And then we also will be selecting an herbicide based on the biology of that specific weed. In the big scheme of things, we have what are called pre-emergent weed controls. These are preventative measures. So wherever we can prevent problems, whether it's through our cultural practices or with preventative weed treatments, that will always be our preferred approach, okay? It's not always possible, the time of year, what's growing around it, those kind of things come into play. So our other option is what we call a post-emergent. This is a weed killer. It's something that's applied after the plant has already germinated, it's up and growing. So I'll be using those words pre-emergent and post-emergent before the seed starts and after it's growing. 
Uh, there's also, we get into this thing of selectivity, particularly lawn care, for example, where I might say, hey, I want to kill the clover or kill the dandelions, but I don't want to damage the turf. So I have to go in and selectively try to kill one plant without harming the other. That adds another level of challenge to it. Um, there are also non-selective weed killers. This is the total kill. So you might have where weeds are coming up and cracks between the driveway and the sidewalk. I don't have to worry about any collateral damage. And I might just go in there uh, and apply something basically to eradicate whatever's growing. So I know I'm throwing a lot of terms out there at you, but we'll go through this a little bit more detail. So this brings us down to where we are right now today. So it's the middle of March. Uh, soil temperatures are beginning to warm up. We know that weed seeds sitting there dormant in the soil. And those weed seeds are going to start germinate as the soil temperatures become warmer. So right now, a lot of people are out applying a, a pre-emergent weed control. You can go out now and apply a preventer. And when I say now, really somewhere between about March 15 to April 15 is ideal. Um, I'm fine even if we go even as late as May. But the idea is somewhere over the next two, four, six weeks, you really want to take this opportunity to put something down to prevent weeds from growing. And this can be either your lawn or your landscape. So we have a lot of different options, but I'm showing you this one, the Preen Lawn Crabgrass Control. This is by far our most popular one. This is just the weed preventer. There's no fertilizers, there's no weed killer, there's nothing else in there. This is just put down to prevent the seeds of those summer annuals from growing. It's not going to last all year, so we generally recommend that you come back and make another application about two to three months after applying it now. So if you do it now, basically again in June, that will keep your lawn pretty much weed free. Uh, I'm also putting another product in here that's called Gallery because, for example, the dimension that we talked about or that preen crabgrass control, I'm, I'm carrying confused things with names. These are all the same product, but the, the preen or dimension, as I was calling it, that's specifically after crabgrass, goosegrass, and a handful of many of your broadleaf weeds. But for example, the preen, if I'm going backwards, this does not control dandelions. It does not control clover. This one, the gallery, does not control crabgrass, but it does control dandelions and clover. So this is where I'm saying it just gets a little confusing where we need to identify the weeds that we're trying to manage and then we can help specifically target products to those weeds. So again, if you wanted to prevent those broadleaf weeds, this also needs to go down sometime within the next from today till the end of April, somewhere in that window of opportunity. They can be applied at the same time, um, and we'll talk you through all those details. Many people that don't want to be using chemical treatments in their gardens, um, there are also organic options, so that's corn gluten meal. This is a food grade material. It's gonna provide both nitrogen as a nutrient, and it also is gonna provide a pre-emergent uh, control on the weeds it's not going to be as long lasting or as effective as the chemical options, but I just wanna let you know that we do have organic um, products available. All of these products, it doesn't matter if you are using the, the corn gluten or the, the gallery or preen or any of the other weed pre-emergence, their mode of action is you're treating the soil. This little graphic is trying to show when you apply it, it's often applied as a granule, you put that down, it needs to be initiated with some watering, and this forms a chemical barrier on the surface of the ground. So the roots of the plant stay down here in the soil, not in, so they don't come in contact with the product. Of, and this barrier of weed seeds that exist near the surface, as they begin to germinate, it prevents that from being able to get rooted in, and it prevents it from getting established. So they do not kill the seeds, that seed bank is still there, and they will only last for a limited period of time. And this is where people have the biggest issue. You'll say, I put a weed preventer down in 1st of April. And let's pretend if you put corn gluten down, that's gonna work through the month of April, best case scenario. 
and then it begins degrading. So at some point in May, that barrier degrades, it breaks down, and then the weeds start popping through. If you're using dimension and you put it down the 1st of April, that weed barrier is going to break down sometime before the end of June, and then weeds will start popping up in July. So they vary in the longevity of the effectiveness. Um, and that's one of the things that we try to help you through is understand when and where your next step is. But these products, they work well. And if you're disappointed, it's probably because you're not doing your follow-up applications. The other thing I have to say is a lot of people are seeding their lawns right now, filling bare patches and stuff. The weed controls, the pre-emergence that I was just discussing, inhibit and prevent seed from germinating. So they cannot be applied at the time of seeding. Okay. This is a specialty product. Um, this Scott Step One. It's also being sold under the name of Triple Action. Uh, they're they're changing their labeling and stuff. On this is very chemistry specific. It's a starter fertilizer with a weed preventer that can be used at the same time as seeding. So there's always ways that we can work around these situations, but it gets into these really specialty type products. And we love to talk to you, give you the details on it. One last little thing I'm going to show you. I think this is it. And then we'll be able to take some questions is the, I had also mentioned the post emergent. These are products that are, you can go out and use to kill weeds without damaging your turf. Okay. So it's a selective control. They need to be applied when the weeds are actively growing. So this is generally when temperatures are going to be above 50 degrees and dry weather conditions. So all this does get impacted and affected by the weather. Uh, everything I'm telling you is spelled out on the labels, but also that's why I really prefer that you come in, speak to us at the plant clinic so we can make sure you fill in on everything that's going. So what I'm doing, because I know this is a lot of information and a little bit of time, uh, I'm just going to leave this screen up so you can write down any of these uh, references for you while we start taking questions, because a lot of this, it becomes difficult just even identifying the weeds before we can get into the control side of it. To me, these are three great resources. The Flora of Virginia, that's an app that you can put on your phone for about 20 bucks. It essentially, it's a field guide to the non-cultivated plants that you will encounter uh, throughout Virginia and, and into the surrounding region. It's a pretty technical type of guide. So it's not just you're going to flip it open and go to the picture. But if you're into this and you want to learn more about botany, learn more about our vegetation and are willing and have the patience to, that's a good technical guide that lives on your phone. Um, if you're looking for just um, something that has fantastic pictures, that's easy to use and covers most of the common true weeds that we encounter, uh, then North Carolina uh, has a fantastic uh, website that you can see there, the Weeds and Turf. And if you want a printed form, uh, you can track down through uh, online book sales. We don't have this, but Cornell University Press has this Weeds of the Northeast. So I'm going to leave that picture up just for a while so you can take, um, take that information down. And now I will reach out to Sally and see, do we have questions? Thanks, David. Yes, we do. Um, just a reminder, everybody, type your questions into the chat box if we or if you're uh, or in Q and A if you're on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, I'm checking the comments. Um, first question: How do you spread pre-emergent herbicide broadcast or to the affected area? Yeah. So, so most of the pre-emergent herbicides come as as a granular product. You can apply it as a liquid and the liquids work just as well, but most people prefer to use a, a spreader application so they can direct it. Uh, you can, you put this basically, if you know from your history, you know that you have problem areas, you can just hit the problem areas, but most people just do a broadcast application sort of cover their entire lawn or their entire landscape beds. Uh, because it's really hard to predict exactly when and where the weeds are coming up. But that, that's personal choice. If you want to reduce pesticide use or just uh, sometimes even reducing expense, you can just target the high priority areas or the places that you know you have a history of problems. That makes sense. Uh, all right. Next question. 
what weed preventers are safe to be used if animals are loose in your yard, like dogs and chickens? So my, my thing is this really comes down to a lot of just sort of personal choices that, that you're going to have to make. The products that I'm showing are all labeled and approved for use uh, according to directions, uh, even where pets and children are present. Um, I would tell you, I probably would get, if I had chickens that are feeding off that area, I'd probably get to the point, especially maybe I just don't put down a weed preventer. The corn gluten is a food grade product. So when you put corn gluten down, your dogs and chickens are probably just going to eat it. There's nothing harmful with that. It's used as a common component in pet foods and livestock foods, but it kind of defeats the purpose if I apply corn gluten. Uh, and then that's followed by dogs and chickens that might be eating it. But that, that's, again, that's a choice you could make. It's totally, completely um, pet and animal safe. Uh, you can use it, but they will try to eat it. It's a food for them. All right, perfect. And thank you. We just got a note um, that the link in the middle might be NCSU, not NSCU. Does that yeah. I think that you are right on that. I was staring at that and realized I think that I put a typo in there because okay, so right that's the line of safety. You're writing that down. Okay, thank you to the person who caught that. Um, all right, next question. Uh, when, so I think this refers to the Scots, the where you can put the weed preventer and the fertilizer in one product. When can you use a weed and feed? Uh, so this this is specific to, I'm stopping, so I go. Uh, the, let, let's pretend if, if you're putting grass seed down, we cannot put any kind of weed treatments on that until it's been mowed at least three times. Once that grass has been mowed three times, then we call it an established grass and we can start putting our weed treatments on it. So I can't give you an exact time frame because it's really dictated by temperatures, but my guess is if you went out and seeded your lawn today, it probably won't start germinating till we get to about, it might be another three, four weeks before you actually start to see grass growing. And it's probably going to be another eight weeks before it's getting its second or third cut on. So that would be an example of where hey, I'm seeding my lawn now, but I really can't put any kind of weed treatment on that for about another eight to 10 weeks, you know, depending on how the grass grows. Again, there's always exceptions. So that Scott's product is the exception that one can be used at the same time as seeding. And I think that's what the uh, question is referring to. Does that sound right, Sally? Sounds right, yes. Um, all right, next question. Uh, how do you prevent buttercup? So buttercups are a perennial wildflower weed that's in there. Uh, again, with a weed preventer. So for example, if I was to put gallery down, that can prevent any seed from spreading. It doesn't get rid of the buttercups that are there but it can prevent their seed from germinating. And that remains effective for about five months at a time. So you would be doing essentially a combination of where you would have to use a post-emergent, which would be killing the existing weeds or digging by hand and then following that with an application of galleries. So that's an example of a fairly persistent, hard to control weed. And I'm not giving some real specific recommendations because these are the kind of things we, we just we, we need to speak to you in person. It's not I'm not trying to withhold information, but you have so many choices and options. We just want to make sure you get the accurate and the good information. Yeah, that's great. That's one of the reasons our plant clinic is here for everybody. So y'all can give detailed information on a case by case basis, which is good. Um, next question. Does the corn gluten meal prevent all roots from penetrating? Like, will it affect plants other than crabgrass? Like, does it affect your lawn? Yes. Yeah, so corn gluten is, is non-selective. It basically forms a barrier against seeds germinating. Uh, I will, I'm just going to say myself, I used it myself personally for a period of about five years. Uh, it's like anything in, in life and in gardening. People, you're going to come away and have different ex experiences from it. I would prefer to use the word weed suppression uh, as a post control. It will reduce the number of weeds, the population of the weeds, but it doesn't really provide a very high level of control. So this comes down to what your expectations are. In the trade, when we say control, we're looking for like 80, 90% effectiveness. 
my take with corn gluten is you may get about 50% effectiveness and it doesn't last quite as long. But the good news is it can be used on lawns, gardens, vegetable gardens. Uh, it's non-selective. It's effective against all weeds. It's a tool that we have available, but just uh, my, my managing expectations talk all the time. Um, it's not going to give you the same results and not last as long as what some of the chemical products do. Got it. Okay. Um, what are the pros and cons of spraying weed be gone on individual weeds in a small lawn area? Uh, so that is really the preferred way. What we're talking about is spot treatment. Uh, if we're doing good, uh, we really can minimize our pesticide use. And if it's just a handful of weeds here and there, then we don't need to treat the entire lawn. We can just go through and just spot treat, as I said, where the weeds exist. That reduces our use of pesticide. And that ultimately is where we want to get to. So if that's practical for you, by all means, do so. Sometimes uh, I work with somebody, hey, you've just bought a new house, there's neglected lawn or something happened, and it is so covered with weeds. It, you know, it's like 40, 50 percent weeds, in which case you're probably going to do more of a broadcast application over the entire lawn. So those are the kind of individual decisions and judgments we love to talk with you about to minimize our pesticide use and still get the results that you want. Great. OK. Um... If I put pre-emergent down and it doesn't rain, is that a problem? How long can it be on the lawn before needing to be washed in? Yeah, most of them, uh, you can always check the label. Most of them want to be watered in within two to three days of application. So it doesn't have to be instant. A lot of times you can put it down and just wait for your next rain shower. But if two or three days have gone by, uh, it's probably best if you do take the time to lightly water it in. And all this is doing is just getting that material to bind to the soil surface. So it doesn't have to be a heavy watering. I mean, if, if you get a quarter inch, half inch of water down, that's enough just to get it to the soil surface. Okay. We just asked someone to confirm, how long do we wait? So when you're, if you're applying a pre-emergent and then you're going to seed and fertilize, you've said you need to wait until you've mown the lawn two to three times? So that's the opposite scenario there. If you apply a pre-emergent first, many of these products, like if you look at the, the um, dimension that I was recommending, it's the, I keep going back for Tweezy's name, sorry. Dimension is the active ingredient that's in the, the pre and crabgrass control. If you put that down, if I remember correctly, that has like a 12, maybe even a 16 week waiting time. So if I put that down first, I have to wait three months before I can seed and three months from now is too late for you to do the seeding. Got it. So you want to make sure that you're seeding first. Right. Or that's where that Scott's product really comes in um, as an option to help if you're in that circumstance. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, all right. Next question. My gardener thinks that pre-emergent herbicides like pre and extended control should not be placed close to plants when applying it. Is this true? Uh, so they, it should be used only around well-rooted established plants because the concern is, again, as I show my little graphic, that the, the pre-emergent sits here near the surface of the soil and the plant roots are down here, right? So, so we don't want those two to meet. Um, it, it's pretty much check again, check the label, but it's been tested on a broad range of plants. Um, it's been used on there without showing any injury. I will say, because I use it myself and just my own observations, I do think sometimes on some shallow rooted ground covers, for example, I think it does hold them back. It doesn't necessarily hurt them or kill them, but I think it does kind of stunt their spread and development. So I've gotten to where I'm a little more standoffish in the case of some shallow rooted ground covers. But if they're deeply rooted perennials or, and certainly with trees and shrubs, I have no problem putting it right over the root zone. Got it. Okay. Um, next question. This is for garden beds. If you're putting down preen granules to prevent weeds in a garden bed, should you put them on, sprinkle them around your garden bed before you put down the mulch or after you put down the mulch? Yeah. So both ways work. Uh, this is a question that actually has been looked at and researched pretty thoroughly. What will happen is if I put my preen down and then mulch on top of it, the nice thing about that is that mulch layer protects it somewhat from photo degradation, 
uh, sunlight rain type of thing. And so it actually lasts longer than if I put it on top of the mulch. Okay. Having said that, the manufacturer recommends that I apply it on top of the mulch because you can imagine their concern is if, if I have pre sitting under a layer of mulch, a little dandelion seed blows over, that dandelion might actually become rooted in the mulch. So either method will work with you. What I personally, what I'll practice is I'll put down a pre-emergent, let's say now, put a thin, uh, just a shallow layer of mulch over top of it. That preen for gardens has about, I have to do it every three months. So my subsequent applications, I'll put on top of the mulch. So you've got a lot of flexibility in how you go about that. Good, good. Um, all right, this is actually the last question. Uh, which is more effective, preen or Trimac? Do you have a preference? So those are two very different products. Uh, okay. Preen, preen is a pre-emergent. It's a preventative um, weed treatment. Trimec is a post-emergent. It's to kill existing weeds. So they're both excellent products, uh, but they're just used differently. And they can be used in tandem. They can be used together, uh, even at the same time, same day. So uh, that's just the difference between a killer and a preventer. Got it. Got it. They serve different purposes. Oh, we've had one more question come in. Uh, is it okay to apply a weed killer near a vegetable garden? What's your opinion? Uh, be extremely cautious with that. Uh, a lot of times that we have trouble is what we call drift, where uh, if a, a, even a light breeze comes, if you're applying a weed killer, a light breeze can cause that herbicide to drift from the area you're applying it over into the vegetable garden, for example. And tomatoes is a classic example, but they're extremely sensitive to herbicides. We see herbicide damage, and I saw a lot more of this last year. I personally think that our wind is becoming more prevalent and more, uh, more intense. I've never heard any of this like in, in terms of climate change. I don't hear anybody talking about the wind, but I'm, I, I can't stand windy conditions. So I'm like hypersensitive to it. I think we're getting more and more wind that leaves uh, drift vulnerable over in the vegetable gardens. So I'm, in my long-winded way, I'm saying just be really, really cautious about it, uh, that, that the weed product, weed control does not go where you're growing vegetables. Okay, that is, that's good information. Um, all right, it looks like that is all of our questions that have come up. Oh, we have one more. Uh, okay, this is a follow-up. Is the vegetable damage from, from the herbicide, does it just limit the plant or is it dangerous? It makes it, does it make it dangerous to eat the vegetables? If that happens, um, mostly we're talking about uh, injury and damage to the plant. Got it. Okay, yeah. that's that's also. Good. Of course, you don't want to eat them. They're not labeled for use on food crops, but but the plants are probably more sensitive to it than than you or I are. And if your tomato plant curls up and dies, then then you don't have anything to eat. Yeah, then you get no tomatoes. Um, all right, that's all the questions we have for now. So I know I think you have a little- I uh, have my bonus right. quiz, right. This is just gonna be a minute. I'm gonna give you my weed control quiz. Uh, I've asked, I, I made sure I did not send Sally the answer sheet on this. I myself like I did last time when you did trees. <laughs> so what's gonna happen? I'm gonna give you kind of a couple weed control questions pop up and, and you just decide if you wanna play along or not with this. Uh, and you can either just maybe put your answer in on the chat function if you want to do that and you can compare with Sal or you can just jot it down on a piece of paper yourself. Uh, but let's see if I was effective in any way, shape or form getting this message across today. Yeah, please feel free to chat these in. I'm not good at we identifying plants apparently. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm expecting um, most of you to know what plant this is, and you can see the question, wildflower weed. I will just give you a few seconds here to jot down your answer. I'm going to write these down this time. All right, Sal, you get any responses on this? I, I'm getting both, both wildflower and weed. <laughs> And I'm guessing is somebody put the name out there, what it is. Has any, does anybody know the name? Y'all feel free to chime in. Wildflower and violet. Terrible weed. <laughs> violet. <laughs> so, so again, this is all kind of fun and games, but um, so it's, it is a wild violet. And again, this is why I keep saying, this is all a matter of perspective. Some yeah. people just would look at this and say, 
this is a beautiful uh, native wildflower. And I would say, I totally see that. And other people look at, say, this is an aggressive weed that I can't seem to stop. It's just a really neat plant. In my opinion, it is a perennial of uh, what it does is it produces these flowers that we all see and love, but it also produces what we call cleistogamous flower down near the soil line, sometimes even underground. So this is like a survival strategy where even if you some wildlife comes along, your rabbits or somebody was come and eat the flowers off of there, I still have a second set of flowers down here capable of producing seeds. And these seeds have this what's called an eliasome. It's this little, um, it's, it's a little full of lipids and fats. And ants will come pick this up because they want to ingest that little snack, that high, high fat snack that the plant left for them. And in the process, they disseminate and plant the seeds. It also spreads by a little rhizome. So again, I just I I'm just amazed kind of with the biology of this plant, how it lives, how it survives. And if you don't learn to love and appreciate it, then you've got a very persistent weed on your hands. This is, now we start getting harder, more difficult. To, can anybody, I don't expect anybody to get this, but I'll give you a chance. And I'll give you a clue. This will be appearing in your yard next month. I used to know what this one was and I can't think of the name. If anybody knows it, feel free to chime in. Sally, I'm gonna give you a break. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna see this in Florida. No, yeah, that's what I remember it up, up in Virginia, but yeah, I, we don't get this in Florida. Goose grass, six weeks grass, stilt grass, foxtail, Japanese stilt grass, April something. These are all names that are coming in. Wrong, 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 <laughs> wrong. Okay, okay. okay. So uh, I think I put the answers in here. Um, and then there's no reason you should know these. I, again, we're playing. But this is annual bluegrass. This is rough bluegrass. Um, in many of our lawns, we grow Kentucky bluegrass. So you have to realize that here in this area, we've got about six different species of bluegrass. Uh, some of them are used for turf, as in the Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, and some of them are used, uh, become weeds that are in there. So the key thing I want to look at here, again, is the importance of getting a value, uh, getting them identified. This is annual bluegrass. It will be popping up very soon in the next two to th four weeks, I would say. Um, it's got this very kind of, they describe as apple green, kind of limey green color. And when the seed heads form, they, they actually stand out, really pronounced this kind of white coloration. Um, this is what's called a rough stalk bluegrass. It's actually sometimes incorporated into shady grass seed mixes. We don't use it in our Maryfield blends, but it will grow in cool, damp environments. It has, when it starts flowering for us as we go into late April, May, it gets this very bright, limey green color, very fine texture, clumpy, um, and it doesn't blend nicely with our other turf grass varieties. In terms of control, again, this, the annual bluegrass, the key word is annual. So each year it dies. So I could put a weed preventer down if I know I have a history with that. Whereas the rough bluegrass is a perennial. Uh, so they look similar, they can be hard to tell apart, they show up at different times, but two very different control strategies necessary. Got it, we have a question. Is there an onion grass coming up right now? Does that sound familiar? Yes, but I can't say that because it's technically not a grass. Uh, oh, okay. Onions are in the lily family, so they are really hard to control. It's a perennial. It forms that little bulb down there. And we'll talk to you. We can give you some options as far as herbicides go, but many times it just, you have to resort to digging it out. So no good answers on that one. So maybe email us if you're dealing with onion grass and we can't yeah, just call, call just us. the clinic and see us near but you'll probably be digging by hand. All right. Thank you. This is another tough one. I don't really expect anybody to get. Mm -hmm. Sally, you know, I forgot, you know, Sally, I knew we were going to go a little bit over playing our game. So I hope you're okay. I don't have to. Yeah, you all need to leave. I know we usually try to wrap up at 
2.45, uh, feel free to jump off. We are recording, uh, so you can email me and ask for a copy of that. Yep. Okay, someone says Bermuda, stiltgrass. The questions are mostly crab, crabgrass, stiltgrass, Bermuda grass. Okay, we got at least some half answers there. Thimble. Uh, thimble will and stiltgrass. Uh, these can be extremely difficult to tell apart. They are both warm season grasses. So what happens is nimble will, this one here, is a perennial. It's dormant. So it has kind of a brown color right now because it's still in this dormant state, but it will be gradually greening up. It is a native grass, uh, but we often consider it a weed because it just doesn't blend nicely in our lawns. The other one, Japanese stilt grass, is probably the most widely dispersed weed throughout Virginia right now. It is definitely a weed. It was accidentally introduced, like I said, as packaging material. It is a summer annual. So it's an example of where the seeds are sitting in the soil right now today. That seed can start germinating as early as March. So it germinates even on a little bit slightly colder soil temperatures. So you can put down a weed preventer. You could put down like that preen crabgrass control it provides a pretty effective barrier against this weed growing. Um, and then, like I said, you will need to make a second follow-up application in June, but we can manage this pretty well with some of our weed preventers. So again, the identification, one's a perennial, one's an annual, they're both warm season or summer plants. Uh, and I really hope I'm coming to the end of this quiz because I'm taking too much of your time. Uh, but Hard to see in the image, but uh, people say it grows three times faster than the other grass, pulls up real easy, keeps coming back. What is it? How do I get rid of it? And this usually shows up in June or July. And often found in damp spaces. Mm. And has a yellow green color. And it's perennial. Here's my close up. Guess is it's still grass. The only thing I could even know to guess is. No, nope. this, this is yellow nut sedge, uh, another hard to control perennial, forms little tubers under the ground. There are specific sedge killers. So it's not a grass, it's not a broadleaf plant. Sedges are in their own classification um, and you gotta be persistent. But again, CS will tell you about control options. Um, I think, I keep saying, I think this is the end of my quiz, but we've seen Japanese still grass a couple of times. We've talked about it. Um, I'm expect everybody to get this one right. Which is it? Summer annual, winter annual, perennial. I think I know this one. We have A, summer annual. The, is it an annual? Yep, summer <laughs> annual. So yeah, you guys, everybody did great out there. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Always do appreciate you playing along, putting up with my little quizzes because I just uh, the plant world. I've always been fascinated by it. I love sharing uh, whatever little bit I know about it, and hope that you'll catch the bug as well. I think next week or next two weeks from now when I come back, I think right now I'm going to talk with you guys about dogwoods. Um, that's always open for conversation discussion. So if you have ideas, share them. Otherwise, I'll see you in a couple of weeks discussing dogwoods. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us and playing along. I'm going to turn it back to Sally. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, again, if you want a copy of the recording for this class, just hit reply. If you're on Zoom, hit reply to your confirmation email. Send me an email. Uh, you can reach me at esperos at mgcmail.com as well. Um, or you can hit the contact us button through the website. That goes to my colleague, uh, Danny, uh, who sits near David and can, and can help you get set up with a recording. Thank you all. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Let's go yet. How'd we do? I, I remember last time. You're asking, no, I, I did just as badly as I thought I would, David. I think I got two right again. Okay. Well, we'll keep working on it. <laughs> okay, I keep working on me. I'll get there eventually, but I work in marketing for a reason. <laughs> so there's a reason I'm not advising people on their, on their weeds for their lawn. All right, everybody have a great afternoon. Bye, David. Bye-bye.